Hi guys, thanks for coming. Um, I'm super excited to be your master of ceremonies today. I just found out like an hour ago that's what MC stood for. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be a good. Um, like just said, we're really excited to have such a great turnout. This is the first time we've tried this as a department, so we're really excited to see how it goes. Um, I know Megan's been great about getting word out to this department and other departments, and someone called up Jess the other day and was like, hey, is plant biology having a fight next week? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got some good publicity. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been some debate about whether this is a throwdown or a smackdown, but I thought I'd let you guys decide for yourself, because either way, it's going to be wild. <laughs> so. Uh, like just said, it's the, two, the 2014 Plant Biology 3-Minute Throwdown. Well, I guess that solves that issue. It's a throwdown. <laughs> um, so before we get started, I wanted to introduce you guys to the rules and then the judging criteria for how this throwdown is going to work. Um, for the presenters, you will each be allowed one slide, and that includes no animation, no sound, and no video. Also, no props, except for your hands. Um, and most importantly, your presentation cannot exceed a, the three-minute mark, and that's absolutely critical. And Carlina has graciously volunteered um, <laughs> down in front to keep track of time. Um, so she's got a comically large stopwatch on her iPad that'll count down from three minutes. Um, but if you go over the three-minute mark, you will be automatically disqualified. So no pressure, but it's not it's a three minute thesis competition for a reason. Uh, I guess it's just hanging out in one of the student offices. Um, <laughs> I would agree with that. Uh, the presentations will be judged on three main categories, comprehension, engagement, and communication. And this is basically, you know, did the presentation make sense? Did the audience understand it? Was it engaging and made people want to hear more? And was it communicated in a way that was effective for a non-specialist audience? And this is a really important um, part of scientific communication. So. Um, uh, these are criteria that you guys should keep in mind when you're voting for your People's Choice Awards. Did everyone get one of these neat little ballots? Since you'll be doing some voting today. And if you don't have one, make sure you get one. Um, so you will be able to help uh, contribute to naming one of our winners today. Um, but because plant biology rolls hard, we also decided to bring in some professional judges to make this the real deal. <laughs> so I'd like to take a moment to introduce our judges. Uh, first, we've got Dr. K uh, Katrin Stanger-Hall, who co-taught a science communication seminar in the plant biology department a couple years ago that Jess and I took, and it was awesome. And she also uh, participated in judging the three-minute thesis preliminary rounds, uh, the one that the grad school does. Uh, next is Dr. Stephanie Pearl, who uh, is a newly minted doctor from our department, so welcome back, Stephanie. She also co-taught the science communication seminar with uh, Dr. Stanger Hall, and she's also a co-organizer for the Athens Science Cafe that Jess talked about. Um, and the flow of this is very nice because she is also a co-organizer of the Athens Science Cafe with our next judge, Mr. James Hadaway, who works for the OVPR. And she also helped with the three-minute thesis judging for the grad school um, and is involved with lots of science communication courses, uh, like our fourth judge, Mr. Anthony uh, Morata from the Department of Theater and Film Studies. And he's the one who teaches the GRSC course on science communication, which a lot of plant biograd students have taken. And they said it's awesome. Um, so that's basically it. That's my spiel. Um, is ever, does everyone understand the rules? Is everyone excited to see some rapid fire science? All right. In the spirit of a smackdown, I just have to say throwdown. Throw in, in the spirit of a throwdown, I'm going to say let's get ready to botanically rumble. Oh, wait, wait. Um, I just remembered. Uh, one more thing. Uh, please hold your applause until the ends of all the presentations. Um, so we'll have an easier time transitioning between um, participants. So just hold all your applause to the end and then go nuts. Okay? Question. Are you all going to position the official clock so that the speaker can see it? Well, Carlina will uh, hold them up so the speakers can see the three-minute countdown. All right? So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our first contestant uh, from... 
entering the ring from team grad school, we've got <laughs> Miss Chelsea setting the bar high canard from the Lankow Lab. And she's going to talk to us today about something entitled Attack of the Invasive Plants. Can they ever be stopped? Mm -hmm. All right, Chelsea, take it away. Thank you. When you think of invasion, the first thing that probably pops into your head is aliens from outer space. But when I think of invasions, I automatically picture plant species from this planet. Although we may think of different things, alien and plant invasions do have some things in common. First off, when aliens and plants, alien and plant invasions both require the movement of the species into a new area from its native land. Second, when aliens and plants invade, they become the dominant species in the community and cause all sorts of problems. Invasive plants can alter ecosystem <coughs> services like decrease pollution mitigation and local biodiversity. For my dissertation, I decided to study the invasive plant over the alien because they're a little less scary and easier to find. <laughs> I have chosen to study an invasive grass, Japanese stilt grass, and whether it's able to maintain being an aggressive invader through time. Scientists think that one reason why certain plant species are able to become invasive is because they escape their specialized pests and pathogens. In the native range, these pests and pathogens, like insects and fungi, are able to stabilize the population. But when these plant species move into their invasive range, they escape these specialized enemies, and this allows for explosive population growth. However, it's unclear for how long this actual release from enemies can last for. It's quite possible that these enemies can catch up to, their, to these invaders, either by coming from the native range or developing in the invasive range. In my research, I will explore whether this invasive grass accumulates soil fungal pathogens through time and whether this can be related to a decline in the grass's health. So far, what I have suspected is supported by my data. I have found an increase in mortality at older invaded sites, and this is correlated with the change in the fungal community in the soil. Although I still have some work to do to figure out whether this change in the fungal community is actually pathogen related. This research is really important because understanding how invasion plays out through time can actually help in management goals. If invaders are becoming less aggressive, through time, then the problems they are causing are probably decreasing as well. So targeting the younger populations would be ideal for managers. So although I'm not saving the planet from alien invasions from outer space, I am aiding in, by doing my research, I am aiding by a large impact on um, real world plant invasions. Thank you. What did I say? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea. All right. See, not bad, right? Get all, get all the anxiety out. It's a good thing that was only three minutes. Otherwise, it would have started growing on me. Uh... <laughs> all right. All right. Enough of that. So now we've got our first participant from team faculty. Dr. Chris Peterson, uh, and he's going to shake things up a little bit uh, uh, with his presentation called Using Tree Wind Damage to Improve Meteorology's EF Scale. All right, so most of you know that I've been studying uh, windstorm damage to trees and forests for most of my career. Um, during that time, I've realized that the meteorolog meteorological community has a problem. Um, and that is uh, one of their most dangerous phenomenon, tornadoes, uh, we all know about them, uh, are very hard to study. They're short-lived, they're very unpredictable, um, very hard to study in real time unless you happen to be parked in the right place with your Doppler radar pointed at the tornado. It doesn't happen very often. Um, so as a result of that, they're forced to sort of rely on retrospective approaches to study tornadoes. Uh, one of which uh, you've probably all heard of is the F scale or the EF scale is the new name. Um, this is a damage scale in which uh, tornado wind speeds and tornado behavior is inferred based on damage to buildings or structures or, in fact, trees. Uh, this is where I come in. Um, I can help them. So uh, the, the problem is the EF scale 
um, it has a number of criteria uh, for, for rating tornado intensity. Most of those criteria are based on buildings. Some of them are based on trees. Uh, unfortunately, the tree part of the EF scale is deeply flawed. Uh, it has a lot of problems, and I've been telling them this for a couple of years now, and they're starting to listen, thankfully. Um, but instead of just sitting on the sideline and complaining, I thought, how can I help them, because I do know a little bit about trees, and the answer seemed to be uh, help them calibrate the, the tree part of the EF scale. And so how do we do that? Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about here for a minute or so. Um, and that is to go to a post-storm situation and compare side-by-side -side damage to houses, which are understood really well from an engineering standpoint. Um, we can be pretty confident of our estimates of wind speeds based on house damage and calibrate that to the trees that are right next to the house. So here's a couple of examples. Here's a house that has EF2 damage. Here's a tree that has hardly any damage, and so that would be rated EF0. So that's sort of a problem. So these two pictures kind of illustrate the problem. The answer is to go through for a large number of houses, this is a project that's still underway, um, and compare the damage to houses and the trees that are right next to them and calibrate the tree damage such that we, we know what the wind speed was for the house uh, because that's understood very well. Um, and then we can calibrate the types of damage to the trees, so whether the tree is intact or standing or defoliated or branch is broken or, or whatever. Um, so this is a way that we can improve on the EF scale for the meteorological community hopefully save some lives uh, in the process, and make a contribution from the ecological world uh, to the meteorological world. That's it. Thank you. This clock, this clock is terrifying. If you guys are really excited about a presentation, just... <laughs> Woo! All right. So next, we've got uh, someone from team grad school. We've got Ed Mackatack Mackesy <laughs> talking about another very important issue. Here you go, sir. And he's going to talk to us today about climate change, problems, predictions, and what we can do. All right. Thank you. Right button on your end. All right. On Friday, President Obama set aside $183 million for the western part of the United States. Uh, this upper panel shows why. Uh, this is a map of drought in the western U.S. And the darker colors here represent more pronounced drought. So you can see they're really focused in California. And this has really big impacts on crops, livestock, as well as drinking water. Um, while we can't generalize from a single weather event to global climate change, this is certainly adding to a body of evidence that uh, these drought periods are becoming more and more common and uh, are certainly suggestive of global warming. So what we can see up here in the upper right is a prediction. It's a computer model comparing average temperatures in the year 2100 to present day. And the fact that it's orange and red indicates that we predict it's going to be warmer. The temperatures are, on average, going to increase uh, over time. Uh, so as plant biologists, we're concerned. We want to understand when and where we can plant our crops in this changing environment. And this is a crucial question. Uh, to get at that question, for my dissertation, I'm studying wild sunflower. It's a species with a large range, so it encounters a lot of different environments. Uh, all the way from Mexico up into uh, Canada, actually. And so what you can see here are actually two of uh, the extremes. This is a Texas individual and a Canadian individual. And the first thing that jumps out at you is just the huge size difference. Texas plants are taller. Um, but there's a couple things you can't see. One is that I planted this Canadian individual two weeks later compared to the Texas individual, so it flowers more quickly. We think this is an adaptation to the short growing season seen in Canada. Another thing you can't see is that their fatty acid profile is very different. We think that the fatty acids in Canada uh, derived plants are actually adaptive for their germination in cooler temperatures. Um, so we think we can understand what an adaptive phenotype is in the wild populations, and maybe this can help um, with adapting crops to climate change. Um, but wild populations are also a tool for outreach, and that's what we're seeing over here. Uh, as a part of a module I've developed for Hillsman Middle School, I'm growing wild carrot and lettuce, as well as high-yielding cultivars. And what we're going to do is keep some well-watered 
drought others, and uh, let the students measure the phenotypes. Hopefully they take away two things. One, uh, hopefully they are in awe of the domestication process. Oh wow, this is what a wild carrot looks like. Um, but beyond that, uh, hopefully they can see the impact of climate change on the food we eat, and hopefully that builds a lasting connection and maybe they'll be the future scientists to tackle the problem. Thanks. You guys are scared of me. I like this. All right. Good job, Ed. All right. That was a pretty hot topic, right? <laughs> but there is a purpose for that segue because speaking of hot topics, we've got Dr. Shumei Chang here to talk to us about pollen competition. So, in style. In style. So she's going to talk to us about is bigger always better? <laughs> All right, don't laugh too loud. Okay, um, so actually I'm going to switch, you know, sort of the, the kingdom here a little bit and get you to start thinking about moose, okay? So when you think about moose, what do you think first? It's ridiculously large antlers, right? So sexual selection is actually, um, this theory is, was suggested by somebody by Darwin um, to explain these kind of ridiculous and spectacular traits in animals, okay? So the idea here is that these traits are good for male-male competition, their butt heads, and for female choice. These female individuals are actually basing on these traits to um, select which male they're going to mate with, okay? So these two processes, male-male competition, female choice, are really well accepted in animal literature. But when it comes to plants, people doubt it, okay? They say, oh, well, look, you look at these morning glories, they are so pretty, anything that can attract pollinators to come to this plant is going to be good for male function, good for female function, and therefore you should not see anything that will be sex specifically um, operating. Okay, so I beg to differ because I think what we are focusing right now is actually these really flashy traits that happen before the pollinators come. But what's important is actually after the pollinators have come. Okay, so these pollinators, they bring pollen grains, they come to the stigmatic surface, this is my representation of stigma, and they say, okay, we have different pollen grains coming from different individuals, now ready, set, go. See who is going to run faster, grow faster, and reach the girls first, right? And so that's the, what I think sexual selection can, in, can be applied to plants, okay? So what I did was that we developed these two lines of pollen, gra uh, pollen grain lines. One has larger pollen grain, one has smaller pollen grains, and we put them on the, on the stigma. And I hope you can see that these little thin lines are actually pollen tubes that are growing out of pollen grains, okay? They're racing down the style tissue to reach the female, the ovules, okay, of these plants, okay? And so the quest, specific question that we're asking in this line of research is, is pollen size, which is a trait that I could find that is, is as male as you can find in a hermaphroditic plant, okay? Is larger pollen grains always better than small pollen grains when it comes to getting the girls, okay? And so we did this, we brought um, larger pollen grains, small pollen grains, put them on the stigma, and then we t look at the seeds that came out from these pollen competitions, male-male competition, and what we found was that indeed, larger is most often better, but not always, okay? So we found 78% of the seeds that actually came from, is that what, what I have left? Okay, so, um, so given that result, <laughs> we wanna know why that happens. Thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> it's horrible. I thought that's what I used. But that's actually what I left. Thank you. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so if it hits zero, are you just gonna like throw something up? Or just wave? Alright. <laughs> Oh, all I can say is, I po me oh my, Shumei. <laughs> that was absolutely more and glorious, don't you guys think? <laughs> all right, all right, I kid. Now, all right, next up from team grad students, we're going to heat things up a bit with our presenter, Jeff.
doesn't need a nickname to sound like a SmackDown champion cannon <laughs> from the Peterson Lab. And he's going to talk to us today about crash and burn, interactions between wind, forest wind damage and fire. There you go. And right button when you're ready. Press what now? Right button okay. when you're ready. Go. Gotcha. So my name is Jeff Cannon, and I study how forests are affected by wind damage and fire. And so um, disturbances like hurricanes and tornadoes and wildfires are really destructive and cause huge loss of life and property, as we saw with the more Oklahoma tornadoes recently and the uh, Arizona fires this summer. And so because fires can be so destructive, it's really important to the public as well as to ecologists that we understand uh, what determines how these disturbances behave. Um, so uh, current research suggests that the, um, the way a disturbance behaves depends in part on what disturbances have occurred previously. So you may expect a wildfire to be really severe if just before the fire a tornado came, toppled lots of trees and created lots of additional fuel. Um, and so, but fuel isn't the only important uh, factor governing fire behavior. There are other important aspects like uh, weather and topography that can have an impact and other fuel characteristics such as the amount of fuel, the type and size, its moisture and arrangement um, can be really important as well. So what my research does is look to see how tornado damage um, can impact these fuel characteristics so that we can better predict how wind damage will influence a subsequent fire. Um, so in order to do this, we've uh, worked in a forest where we've done some simulated wind damage and, and a controlled burn, and uh, we find some pretty, we've looked, found some pretty surprising results. So um, first of all, the most obvious thing is we saw a huge increase in fuel after the tornado damage, and that led to a really intense fire. Um, but what was interesting was that it, the, the increase in fire intensity occurred for reasons other than what we expected. Um, yes, there was a huge increase in, in fuel, but most of that was in the really large size classes like down trunks and branches that never actually burned. So if you exclude those really large size classes, um, the available fuel is actually pretty similar in amount between damaged and undamaged areas. Uh, what changed was the makeup of fuel. So you had a small increase in the amount of fine woody material and grasses in the damaged area. So that leads, um, that gives some explanation to the increased fire intensity. Uh, but what was really drastically different between the damage and the control areas was there was a huge rearrangement of fuel. So um, in the undamaged areas, fuels tended to be spaced out really evenly, uh, evenly distributed, whereas in the damaged area, fuels were clustered tightly together in some areas and really sparse in others. And so if you think about a campfire, it's really easy to see how this rearrangement of the same amount of fuel can lead to an increase in fire intensity. Because you've got fuels clustered close together, the heat from one fuel element can preheat and dry out the next piece of fuel so that the entire um, pile of fuel can burn more completely and with higher intensity. Um, so that just goes to show that the, um, the interaction between wind damage and fire is much more complex than a simple addition of fuel. If we want to understand how destructive disturbances like fire behave, we want to understand um, not, just, uh, not just the changes in fuel amount, but the more complex mechanisms um, through which disturbances interact. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. All right, that was also pretty hot, guys. <laughs> now, okay, don't get me wrong, Jeff is great, but if you're interested in a real fun guy, <laughs> look no further, because representing team faculty, we've got Dr. Michelle Mominy, and she will be talking to us today about exploring the septum cytoskeleton and a fungal model system. Right, I gotta correct ready. you though, I'm a fun gal. <laughs> <laughs> so which one is it? Right button. So the cytoskeleton is a series of scaffolds inside of the cell and these scaffolds support the cell, they shape it, and they help organize all of its activities. Septins are a really recent discovery that play a part in this cytoskeleton. Now it turns out that humans have septins in virtually every cell of the body. When septins are missing or damaged, there are several diseases that can result, and those are symbolized by the ribbons up in the top corner. So leukemia and lymphoma, Alzheimer's, bipolar, schizophrenia, all have been associated with damage to the septins. We don't know if damage to the septins is causing these diseases. We don't actually even know how septins are organized or what else they interact with in the cell. Trying to figure out what septins do in a human is a little bit like trying to figure out what steel does in the world's tallest building. 
The Birch Caliph, pictured over in this corner, is 2,700 feet tall. It's 163 stories, and it has 55,000 tons of steel. Probably not the simplest place to figure out what steel might be doing. Enter the humble fungus. <laughs> yes, bread mold, shower curtains, toenails, that kind of fungus. In the bottom center here is Aspergillus, the fungus we work on in my lab. And fungus is to human as cottage is to the Burj Khalifa. Smaller, simpler, but they have many of the same basic systems. So in one set of experiments in my lab, what we did was take a green glowing tag and add it to a septum. And you can see that result here in the center. In the same way that a string of Christmas lights will show you the position of a roof line, this tag shows you the position of septums within the cell. And what you see in this particular example is a very young fungal cell with one tube coming out, and the septums are forming rods along the outside of that tube. In another series of experiments, we took septums and removed them from this fungal cell. We expected that the cell might collapse, but we, what we saw instead is pictured in this bottom corner. Instead of seeing just one tube emerging from this young cell, we now saw multiple tubes emerging. So we're working right now on trying to understand how the loss of a septum is leading to uncontrolled growth in this fungus. And we think that understanding this will help us better understand the connection between septums and uncontrolled growth in human diseases like cancer. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. I can really see why her research gets a lot of support. <laughs> All right. Next up from team grad students, we've got the guy who's answering some of the big questions. His name is Asparagales Harkesi, but you guys might know him better by his common name, Alex Harkis. And his talk is called, Why the Why? I dedicate this slide to Kelly Daw before I begin. <laughs> Likely, most people in this room have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One of these pairs is called a sex chromosome. It's what genetically determines you as either a female having two X chromosomes or a male having one X and one Y. Now, under the microscope, the X and the Y chromosome look very different in humans, the Y chromosome being about 10% the size of the X and having only about 78 genes relative to the X chromosome's nearly 2,000 genes. So what has been driving the loss of genes on the Y chromosome relative to the human X? Well, we know that this has been happening over the last about 200 million years. What we can't do, though, is go back in time and look at what the Y chromosome used to look like and identify mechanisms that might be initiating this massive loss of genes on the Y chromosome. What we can do, though, is... Sorry, this is important to us because at the current rate of gene loss on the Y chromosome, we may be facing a possible extinction of the Y chromosome in the next 10 or 20 million years. My research is dedicated to all the men out there. <laughs> What we can do, though, is look at systems that have very young sex chromosomes, and we can see what does a very young Y chromosome look like and what might be the mechanisms that drive potential degeneration of Y chromosomes relative to the X. I work with asparagus, something that you might find in the vegetable aisle of your grocery store. Asparagus is a very special plant because it's got very young, identical X and Y sex chromosomes. Just like in humans, XX makes a female plant, XY makes a male. Now, when we look at the X and the Y of asparagus under the microscope, very unlike humans, they look identical to each other. But when we look a little bit closer at the DNA level and we compare the X to the Y and look along its length for differences that might be specific to the gender, what we see is that the Y chromosome is a little bit different from the X. And that specifically, the Y chromosome has a region bound on the left side and the right side that contains genes that are essential for maleness. Now, in this region, it essentially is acting like a trap. We know that these genes need to be on the Y chromosome, so the Y will do everything to keep them in place. Now, like any good trap, things can come in, but things can't come out. So when we look at the Y chromosome relative to the X, what we find is that on the Y chromosome, these potentially harmful DNA elements called transposons are accumulating in this trap on the Y, and they're not being able to be let out. Now, what this eventually is ending up is that maybe the Y chromosome is going... Y chrom 
Y chromosome is going to accumulate as many of these elements as possible, which eventually may be harmful to the Y. So perhaps uh, a more terrible story than anything is that maybe Y chromosomes are born to be destroyed and that there's no stopping this eventual degeneration of the Y chromosome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It's a happy way to go out. <laughs> I think we can all understand why Alex's research is so cool. It's like a history lesson on a chromosome. But if you guys are interested in history, boy, do we have a treat for you today. Dr. Andy Patterson is going to be talking to us about a brief history of plant genome evolution. So some of my earliest childhood memories uh, are of the fruit and vegetable gardens uh, of my parents and grandparents. Uh, I just couldn't get enough of, uh, of Pop Pop's raspberries, uh, of grandma's applesauce, or of mom's tomatoes. Um, moreover, even as a child, I was fascinated by reading seed catalogs, looking at pages and pages of different cultivars of tomato and cucumber and pepper and different sizes and shapes and colors and properties. Um, uh, this interest in, in plant genetics pervaded my education. As a graduate student, I learned how to breed crop cultivars. As a postdoc, I learned how to apply DNA tools to accelerate breeding of crop cultivars. And my lab has continued in, in these activities, uh, developing and implementing tools for crop improvement in collaboration with breeders of the crops that provide us with our briefs, our currency, our vegetables and oils, our grains, our fibers, and, and other uh, medicinal uh, uh, products that are essential to, to life. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the course of this work, we, be, we build up quite a lot of DNA information, eventually building up enough that we could begin to, to literally connect the dots um, between the genomes of, of different organisms, such as our major crops, uh, crops and botanical models, uh, and even begin to make inferences uh, about the nature of the common ancestor of all crops uh, that somehow managed to evade being eaten by a dinosaur 150 million years ago. Um, uh, through the course of this work, um, we found again and again uh, the importance of a phenomenon called polyploidy, uh, which is a genetic accident uh, that results in a genome being multiplied twice or three times or four times or sometimes even five or six times or more, literally overnight. Uh, polyploidy is very common in angiosperms, more common than in any other taxon known, um, uh, even to the point of the, the, the crowning glory, uh, which is canola or brassica napus, uh, that's multiplied its genome 72 times uh, relative to the genome of the common ancestor of, uh, of, of all angiosperms. Um, <clears throat> uh, our ongoing work um, continues to, uh, to, to focus uh, on trying to, to fill in the gaps uh, in this picture of, uh, of angiosperm evolution, connecting more dots from more genomes um, while also continuing to contribute to, to conventional crop improvement. Uh, a particular interest uh, is in studying very recently formed polyploids, uh, where we hope to be able to see literally in real time uh, the process and e processes and events that have given rise to botanical diversity enabling the angiosperms to become the planet's dominant vegetation and also to provide essential ecosystem services. Thank you. Great, thank you. Oh, that was great. Always good to learn a little bit about history and get back to our origins and roots, right guys? Speaking of roots, <laughs> our next contestant is a guy who is so far underground you might think he was a spy. Although, come to think of it, he is a reputed member of the so-called Sunflower Mafia. <laughs> I'm talking about Alan Bauscher from the Donovan Lab, and he'll be talking to us today about the roots of plant adaptation. <laughs> there you go. The future of crop production, the future of food production, is a huge concern, particularly in third world underdeveloped countries that are expected to have the greatest population increases. Ironically, it's these same countries that typically have the lowest fertility soil, the highest susceptibility to drought, and yet the least access to fertilizers. Luckily in the United States, fertilizer availability is not really considered a current issue, although our main source of phosphorus fertilizers, phosphate rock, is expected to be entirely depleted within our lifetimes. 
Clearly, in order to keep pace with growing populations, we're going to need to develop crops that can better tolerate low nutrient, low water, droughted conditions. The trouble is, the majority of our staple food crops today have been bred under high resource conditions for decades. And as a result, most of our food crops exhibit a sharp decline in yield in the absence of high fertilizer inputs. In order to develop crops that can better tolerate these low nutrient dry conditions, we need to instead look to the wild relatives of these crops that can already adapt to those conditions. For example, we can look at the cultivated sunflower up here on the top left, which is grown in about 2 million acres in the United States alone. It's related to wild species such as this one here on the left, which is native to the drought prone salty habitats of the Atlantic coast, or this species in the center here, which grows in the low nutrient desert soils of the Great Basin Desert. The goal of my dissertation research is to understand how these wild sunflower species are able to acquire the water and the nutrients that they need in these extreme environments. In order to understand nutrient and water acquisition, we need to look at the roots, and that's what I do for my research. I study three main aspects of the root systems of these wild sunflower species. First, I study the fine roots, the thinnest portions of those root systems. The reason that's important is that the fine roots encompass the vast majority of nutrient uptake in plant root systems. I measure their size, shape, and production. Second, I study root system architecture, the actual three-dimensional deployment of roots in the soil. After all, nutrient uptake depends not only on the size and the shape of the fine roots, but also where the plant physically places them. Third and finally, I, um, all plant roots secrete various chemical compounds into the soil. Certain compounds secreted by plants have been shown to chemically interact with soil constituents, releasing nutrients that were previously unavailable to the plant. I study the composition and the specific nature of these compounds secreted by wild sunflower roots. It's my hope that studying these three main groups of traits, fine roots, root system architecture, and root secretions, that we can better understand how these wild sunflower species are adapted to those low nutrient, tough environments. Plant breeders can then take this information and be better informed on how to develop sunflower cultivars that can be grown with less fertilizer requirement and less irrigation requirement. Hopefully research in sunflower and the related um, and relatives of related crops can help us achieve this goal within our lifetimes. Thank you. Can I just say, as an objective audience member, I think these are some beautiful plants. <laughs> All right. Uh, for our next contestant from team faculty, we've got Dr. Zhao Yu Zhang, and he's going to help us take a closer look at chromatin modification in plant stem cells. Yes, please. Uh, just remember, you see the tallest tree today on my slide. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a, t a tree that uh, Alex sent me, and... Um, and there are a few uh, dots here that are actually, uh, you, you can probably see it, organisms that we normally refer to as humans. Um, so at the time of discovery, this was the tallest tree in the world and was um, about 370 feet tall. And since it was discovered, it grew a couple of feet taller still. Um, it's probably around a couple thousand years old and it's nowhere near the oldest tree uh, discovered on Earth, which is uh, 9,550 years old. Okay. So we, uh, we don't work on trees, um, exactly. We work on our autopsies. It's very similar to trees. Uh, <laughs> the reason I'm telling you this is, is because really the, the whole above ground part of, uh, of these plants are, are produced by a very small uh, group of cells called uh, uh, the stem cells in the, in the shoot apical meristem called the, uh, um, uh, in the center of the shoot apical meristem. It's going to uh, do two things. They keep on dividing and keep a small population as stem cells, so this is a maintenance part, and they also supply cells to other zones to differentiate into all the above ground um, tissues that you see. So based on gene expression differences, you can define a few different zones that are going to do very different things in the, uh, as the plant develops. Okay? So we work on, on chromatin modification. Uh, we uh, came to realize that the mod Modifications of chromatin probably plays a pretty important role in, the, in regulating the balance between this maintenance and the differentiation part. And the reason is, for example, this is a mutant that cannot uh, trimethylate lysine 27 on histone H3. Okay, so what you're seeing here is actually a double mutant plant. Okay? The really good thing about this plant is it's immortal. So basically it lives forever. Okay? The bad thing is it's going to be looking like this forever. <laughs> 
So it's a ball of uh, uh, undifferentiated stem cells. So the, the problem with this mutant is it cannot differentiate. Okay, so this is all stem cells cannot differentiate. Now this is another mutant that cannot modify another uh, residue on histone H4. The problem with this mutant is, so normally the epical meristem is keep on dividing and providing cells to, do, to um, uh, you know, pr produce more flowers in this case. But this mutant is going to um, produce a few flowers and then quit and ends in a terminal flower. Okay? So developmentally speaking, the problem with that mutant is it cannot maintain the stem cell population. Differentiation, no problem. Maintenance, big problem. Okay? So what we really want to do is to figure out what happens in those um, tiny little cells. We need a few hundred thousand of those. Each plant, we can get a few dozen. So we are developing a high-throughput uh, tagging mechanism that we can use affinity purification to so bypass all the tedious work. You just have to grind up the plant and then do an experiment and you can figure out what's happening in the uh, cells as they're being maintained and differentiated into um, uh, lateral organs. Okay? So this is uh, uh, being done in corn, so we're looking at specifically these cells to figure out how they're maintained, how they transition from one state to another. And hopefully uh, in a year or two, uh, when the corns are old enough or big enough, we can do some experiments. <laughs> Not going to do that in front of a room full of people. Whew. Now you, when you said you were going to show us the world's tallest plant, I started having panic attacks about like some Godzilla or Abidopsis or something. <laughs> All right. Uh, up next, we have our last graduate student presenter, uh, Uma the Tornado Nagendra <laughs> from the Peterson Lab. And her talk is titled, Disturbed Relationships. Can tornadoes <laughs> change plant-soil interactions? In August 2005, Hurricane Katrina blew through my hometown. I came back to find houses moved off their foundations, magnificent trees uprooted or snapped in two. Natural disturbances like these are very powerful, yes. But to me, what's even more powerful is what happens afterwards, recovery and regrowth. We saw this in New Orleans, that people can get together and rebuild. But I'll tell you what, forests are even better at it. They do it all the time. We see landscapes that look barren one year. The next year, they're full of lush green life. When I saw this after Katrina, I wanted to know more. And it turns out we know a good deal about what species come back, but we haven't looked as much at how tornadoes change, what spe how species interact. And species interactions are really important for ecosystems. Take plants and soil, for instance. In one gram of soil, you have millions of bacteria and fungi doing really important jobs. Soil is how plants get the resources they need. And they can't just get up and walk to a new location that has better stuff. So they're at the mercy of those soil organisms to either help them or take advantage of them. It's the relationship between the plants and soil that can determine whether that tree can spread out and dominate an ecosystem or have a diversity of neighbors. And it's not as simple as friend or enemy. It's also about how close that relationship is. If you have some friends that you're really close with, like your best friends, but also people you just share cat pictures with on Facebook. <laughs> the same goes for negative interactions. There's arch enemies like the Joker who just wants to get at Batman. Also some guys who are just jerks to everybody. <laughs> the specialists are like, specialist relationships are like the best friends of the arch enemies. They really just involve a few species. There are others that are generalists that affect just about everybody. And because they affect just about everybody, it's the specialists that can make it or break it for a particular plant. What I expect to see after a tornado, so such an abrupt change in the environment, is that the generalists would be more able to survive the disaster, which means you'd end up with an ecosystem that's full of Facebook friends and jerks, which affect everybody equally. So any disadvantage or advantage that the uh, tree would have in an ordinary situation wouldn't necessarily be there. Now, although I first got interested in this from Hurricane Katrina, this is an issue for not just the Gulf Coast. The past few years, we, we've seen Hurricane Sandy and tornadoes ripping through Oklahoma and Alabama and Georgia. We're seeing stronger hurricanes and more frequent tornadoes, especially in the eastern U.S. So I want to see how these changes to our environment could affect our forest here in Georgia. Good job.
<laughs> wow, I don't know about you guys, but that presentation just blew me away. <laughs> and that concludes all of our graduate student presentations for today. And last but not least, we've got our final from team faculty, Dr. Mark Farmer. And his talk is entitled, Moving Towards Answering Life's Biggest Question. Yeah, right button when you're ready. In my opinion, there's two really big questions in biology. The first is the origin of life itself. How did life emerge from non-living biochemistry? The second question is from those earliest cells, how did it diversify into the wondrous, uh, beautiful world that we see today of biodiversity? And that's a question that was largely answered by Charles Darwin. My research focuses on sort of the intersection between those two. Namely, how did the complex cells that give rise to all the plants, animals, and fungi first arise? And in order to do this, I study a group of organisms, single-celled organisms, that still retain some of those, I think, original features. So when I think about biology, I don't think just about how life is today, but I try to imagine how it was one, even two billion years ago. In my laboratory, we're studying one such structure, the cilium. And if you know anything about cilia, you may have heard them referred to as little tail-like structures on cells that kind of push a cell through the water. But in the organism that I work with, uh, Paranema, it uses its cilium in a variety of different ways. Sure, it can use it to move through the, su through the substrate, but it can also use it to feed itself. It can use it to detect obstacles in its way. It can use it to sense light. It can even use it for lovemaking. <laughs> and I'm not going to show that one. <laughs> we think that the mechanism by which this takes place is related to a group of proteins known as IFT that are within the cilium. And the IFT complex actually moves up one side of railroad tracks, deposits its cargo at the growing end, and comes back down the other side. And in doing so, it actually changes the shape of the membrane of the cilium. And we think that this small change in shape is what's responsible for allowing these cells to do something unusual, which is to glide along the substrate. So what paranema does is it lays its flagellum down in front, its cilium in front of it, and basically glides along in what I think is a very, very ancient form of cell motility. Now, all complex organisms, including ginkgos and geckos, still have these IFT complexes. You and I still have them, and I think that they still play a role in our biology, which is why understanding how paranema moves does have relevance to our understanding of our own biology. Now, if someone came from another galaxy and wanted to know how humans construct buildings, we wouldn't hand them the blueprints to a skyscraper. We would show them a hut with its simple ideas of a wall and a roof and a door by which you go in and out. So in terms of what I do in biology, I study the huts. Thank you. <laughs> going to tell you guys to applaud, but you beat me to it. <laughs> all right, so that concludes all of our three-minute throwdown talks for this year. Um, so now what we're going to do after, you know, uh, get everyone all loosened up is to take a, about a ten-minute break, um, and this will give the judges time to finish their tallies and for you guys to turn in your People's Choice uh, ballots. <laughs> And we can tally those up and award some winners. So refreshments are outside still if you guys would like to. Um, and we'll reconvene in a few. OK. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to give a brief thank you to everybody who helped make this possible, um, namely Plant Biology, the Grad Student Association, and the de whole department as well. That's sort of where the idea originated to make this sort of a, a home event. And I think it turned out really well. Would you guys agree? Yeah. Woo! Also, a big thanks to Beth Richardson in the back, who's been helping record this so it'll exist for all perpetuity, which I'm sure you guys are really excited about. And for uh, folks who helped out uh, making this possible, uh, Megan was really helpful in getting the word out and sending flyers everywhere. Carolina was awesome with her timer of doom. Um, David made that awesome poster that got sent out everywhere and confused people about the SmackDown. And that was great. And Elise has made our wonderful trophy here, which is what you guys are all competing for, the fame and the glory and the honor. 
Also, you guys who participated, you did a phenomenal job, and I'm sure it was stressful out the wazoo, but you guys did great. And finally, a big thanks to our judges who helped, uh, you know, make sure that everything was staying on track. And we've got some cool plant biology swag for you guys. I think we've got, yeah, we've got uh, two drinking vessels, I think, which were our uh, departmental fundraisers. We like to drink a lot, I guess. Um, and last but not least, uh, her name is not on here because she was the one who made the PowerPoint and of course wouldn't put herself on here. But I'd like to give a huge thanks to Jess Stevens who made this entire thing happen. She has done a tremendous amount of work uh, making this a huge success and I don't know if whoever comes after you as our PBGSA peer evaluator will make this happen in the future, but thank you so much, Jess. And, and Caitlin for being an awesome team. Let's go the All right, okay. So now the part you guys are really excited to hear about are the awards. So first, we're gonna announce the best grad student uh, presentation. And where are my results? Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> With a total of 168 points out of a possible, I don't know how many. <laughs> they got a lot of points. Please give a huge shout out to Miss Uma Nagendra. Oh, and and she'd won a what is it, Jess? Twenty dollars gift certificate to Kelly and Tito's. Woo! Woo! All right, next up is the best faculty presentation. And with a total of 154 points, we have Dr. Shumei Chang. <laughs> oh, okay. And $20 on that one for, you. Oh, for Callie and Tito's. All right, next is the People's Choice Award, and the award for that is a totally blinged out koozie, which can be featured at our final Friday events, so you can brag to everyone that which that was Which will be starting up next month again. Yes, and the winner of that swag is Dr. Michelle Mominy. Finally, the moment you guys have all been waiting for is the end all, be all, who was better, faculty or grad students, and the winner with, okay, it was a total of 869 to 825 points. So it's kind of close, guys, but the winner are the graduate students! I think that's all we have for that's you guys. Awesome. So thank you so much again. This has been a